So, does God show up at Best Buy? He does. <laughs> he is the Best Buy, isn't he? Okay, so tell us, tell us what happened. Um, so, this was two Sundays ago. Raju and Finney were leading in worship in Foursquare Whitefish. And after the service, um, he was asked to come and pray. And um, amazingly, that day, a young teenage girl gave her life to the Lord after the service. And there were a couple of healings that took place. Afterwards, we went to visit a family for a um, couple of hours. And, and Raju said, I want to go to Best Buy. And I'm like, I'm hungry. I want to go home. Not Best Buy. Uh, he said, no, I have to go. So, you know, regardless of what I said, he pulled into the Best Buy parking lot. <laughs> and I was like, very sad in my heart that he didn't listen to me. <laughs> so we walk into the store and this young man walks up and, you know, said, okay, what do you want? He's, he's trying to show us around. And, um, and as he was showing us around, all of a sudden, it was, it was just a download, stop, talk to him. He needs my love. The father was speaking to me, and I'm like, God, I don't know this guy. I might just say something that is so out of you know, place, and I'll, I'll look like a, an idiot over here. But it was so strong that I had to speak to him. I just couldn't look at what he's showing me. I was just looking at him, and I said, wait, wait. I have to tell you something. And then I just started sharing with him the father's love for him. And as, as I was speaking, he started crying. And he's looking around that none of his colleagues, his co-workers would see him. And he is hiding and he's wiping his tears. And I, I kept saying, the father loves you. And, you know, some of the bad things that were happening in his life. And he was like, you're right on. You're right on. I kept, I was, I kept on talking to him. And he's like, stop. I need to tell you something. Yesterday night, I had a dream. And in my dream, a, a young, a, a short Asian woman came and she showed me love that I've never seen anywhere. And he just started, you know, just weeping and crying. This has to be some supernatural powers that has, that has shown me this dream. I haven't done a meditation for the last three, four days. I do meditation, I am yoga, you know, stuff, and he's a new age guy and everything. And the moment I heard this, I was like, yes, yes, Lord, you have already paved the road for this to happen. Separately. Um, and then I, uh, I said, okay, this is an opportunity. Let me share the gospel with him. And I said, do you know about Jesus? Do you know he died for you, for, for you and he has already washed your sins? And I just shared the gospel with him. And he said, I need to change some of my you know, thinking about these things because I think I have some misunderstood theologies in my head. He said that after he heard the name Jesus, because he was thinking I was sent by one of his new age gurus. That's what he thought. But the moment he heard Jesus, he was like, oh, okay, I need to rethink what I'm thinking. So I said, Finney, run, go look for daddy. He's somewhere in the store. You need to get him right now. So Finney ran, got Raju. By then, I had already shared the gospel with him. And I said, my husband is going to come and lead you, lead you in, a, in, a, in, a sinner, in a prayer. You know? And so Raju came, and you know, we, he shared some more. He kept on showing me, but I was like going back again and again to what the father was saying, and uh, we led him to the Lord that afternoon. There is more, and Raju will continue that. Isn't that so cool? Yeah, I want you to know that God hears and answers prayer. I know you know that. But sometimes we've got to make outrageous prayers. One of the prayers I prayed uh, with pastors is, God... I want you to visit people in their dreams and they come to churches, you know, and I've prayed that over and over and over again. And when I find this happen, I'm like, wow, Jesus just did that. <laughs> this is not just happening in the Middle East or uh, in India or China. This is happening right here in Kalispell. So, so I leave, we, we finish, I, he, he prays the prayer and we leave and I go to the pastor's meeting in Whitefish on Thursday and I have to pick up something again from Best Buy, I'm not making the connection, I shared with the pastor there because he lives in Whitefish and I said this is his name, this is his number and, uh, and I head up to Best Buy, I'm going in quickly and here's this young man standing, he comes walking up to me and he says, I just want you to know that after we had that conversation that... Um, all my depression lifted. I've suffered with depression for many years. 
And I know you called me. I did not respond to your call, but I was not sure if this is something psychological happening in my mind or if I'm really healed of depression. So uh, the Lord just touched him and healed him right there in Best Buy as he prayed and asked Jesus to come into his heart. And so that was absolutely uh, wonderful. Yeah, we can rejoice. Thank you, Jesus! Amen. <laughs> because God is committed to every single person in this city. And if we can just open our eyes and say, God, I'm available, then he is willing to take, take us and do extraordinary things through us. Um, I don't consider Grace or, or me uh, to be any better or extraordinary than any of you. But we constantly are asking, God, how can we be a blessing to someone? Well, um, I think about two weeks ago, we had a, a pastor friend who, who also visited here. His name is Nick Goff. Uh, he's from Great Falls. He came to teach on the basin. And he called me up and he said, Raju, I've been praying. I need to go to Libby. I want you to go with me. I'm going to minister prophetically, but I want you to come and pray for people. So I had something going on that evening, and I canceled that, and I uh, reorganized and went with him to Libby. And uh, we're in this church that's in the middle of a transition, new pastors there. And he ministers, um, says all kinds of crazy things. He walked up to a woman, and he said, there's something about your kitchen. I think you need to rebuild or remodel your kitchen. It's a place of ministry. And you should have seen that husband. He's like, oh, no. <laughs> now God spoke to my wife. <laughs> and I have to build a kitchen or whatever. It was funny. So he called me up at the end of that time. And, uh, um, and I'm just about to walk up. And I'm praying. I'm saying, God, is there something that you want to do here? And as I'm doing that, the Lord puts it on my heart that he wants to touch someone with a problem in their right hip. And I'm thinking, no, 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 God, please, not this again. Because the last time when he spoke to me, I didn't obey him. I was in, uh, it was in Oregon, and uh, I was preparing for, they had two services. And the first, before the first service, I'm praying, and God puts this name Jerry on my mind. And I'm like, no, Lord, uh, what if there's no one by the name Jerry there? So I just put it away. And then just before I preach, I asked my son, I said, would you pray and say, and ask the Lord if he wants to heal someone? And he says, I see someone sliding off the side of a hill and getting hurt. So I go up, I finish my sermon, and I say, is there someone here that got hurt as you slid on the side of a hill? And here's this lady, she has a walker, and she's coming to the, from the side, and she's just weeping. She's just sobbing that God would put this on a uh, on an 11 year old child's heart. And as she comes up, I ask her, what's your problem? She said, this is what happened. I said, what's your name? She said, Jerry. <laughs> and I was like, oh no, I missed it. <laughs> and uh, I was really very upset with myself. Anyway, God touched her and healed her and she went away um, without her walker. And uh, so this time, I said, I'm not going to make that mistake. I don't care if I didn't hear God. If I just made that in my mind, God, heaven, back me up. <laughs> That's a good prayer if you, if, you're in a, if you don't know what you're doing. Pray you pray that all the time. Okay. I learned it from him. So if there's any problem, you can, you can talk to him. Okay. So, 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 so I go up, and I'm still thinking, what if, what if, what if, and if someone is not here with a hip problem. There weren't many people there. So, so I said, is there anyone here with a problem with their right hip? And the pastor stands up. His wife stands up. This biker comes up. And I'm calling up people to pray for them. And uh, I said, okay, we're going to pray for people. And he says, I'm healed. I'm healed. The pastor. I'm like, oh, okay. So he says, I, uh, no one touched him, no one prayed for him. He was instantly, sovereignly, miraculously healed of his pain, right then and there. So I said, okay, I'm not touching you, I'm not going to pray for you. <laughs> so he was very insistent that no one pray for him because he's healed. <laughs> so, uh, so we started praying for his wife and then we prayed for different people. And uh, the Lord was touching different people and healing them. And we are coming to an end, we are going to say goodbyes and leave. 
randomly this man walks into the church straight up to the to where we were standing and he says my name is Damon um, I need prayer for my right hip I'm like I don't know if he's a believer I don't know if he's part of the church I have no clue this guy hasn't been in the meeting he didn't hear a single word we spoke he hasn't seen anyone heal he just walked straight up to us and said I need prayer I don't know how he landed up in that church. It's a mystery for me. So anyway, I, I say, well, I think God shared with me that he wants to touch people with a problem in their right hip and heal them. So can I pray for you? So I prayed for him. As no extravagant emotions or anything on his face. Uh, I said, so what do you feel? He said, oh. I said, what happened to your hip? He said, I was hit by a semi-truck. And I, was on, I, was, I went out trekking, and I hurt my hip again. I've done three MRIs. The doctors are trying to figure out what is the problem with me. So, so I just prayed for him, and I said, so how are you feeling? He says, I have no pain. I have no pain. I have no pain. There's no expression on his face. And I'm thinking, is this guy really saying? Doesn't he really have pain? So I said, what do you do? How, how do you know if you were healed? So he said, I'm, I teach Taekwondo to kids. That's how I make money. I have to be active, and I haven't been able to. I said, what couldn't you do? He said, I couldn't kick. So I said, would you try? So he goes this way and does this. He says, I have absolutely no pain. I said, turn around and tell the people. So he told them all the story, and I said, do the kick again. He did the kick. He says, I have no pain. And then he turned to me, and he said, well, I'm tired. I need to go to sleep. Then he walked out the door. Reason, the holy child will be called the son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. And she who was called barren is now in her sixth month. For nothing, no thing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now, how many of you know that uh, Mary had to have a little conversation with Joseph? Because Mary has said, yes to God. She has said yes to exactly what the angel described. The Spirit of God is going to overshadow you and you will be impregnated by the very seed of God. But the result is a real baby, which means you're going to begin to show. And it's going to be uh, life-changing. <laughs> So when does this happen? Well, it happens as soon as you say, yes, Lord. You give God permission and he begins to move. The Bible doesn't say exactly at what hour that happened after she said yes to the Lord. All we know is that the Spirit of God overshadowed her. The Spirit of God came over her in a way that only the kingdom of God can. That's something out of the spirit realm. And God's amazing power and life-giving force that flows from him and she received a seed of something that was not of man but of God something not of the earth but of heaven but now she's got to go talk to Joseph at some point because once she said yes to God this thing is in motion there was already something else in motion. She was already betrothed to Joseph. And the plan was that he was going to put his seed in her. <laughs> because he was going to be her husband. In Matthew chapter 2. 
excuse me, chapter 1, starting with verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Uh Uh-oh. He says it so, matter of fact, so clean, you know. It was a mess. She was found to be with child. That sounds so sanitary, you know. (laughs) Um, The Bible doesn't tell us exactly how the conversation went. But in verse 19 says, And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man, and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. Um, it's called end of betrothal. He knows that he has every right to make a big deal out of this, to have her stoned as, uh, as uh, committing uh, fornication against, against their betrothal, uh, to expose her. And under the law, uh, she would be brought forth before the elders. She would be judged, and the community would gather together and stone her. Um, And Joseph had every right under the law, and especially within his own heart, because he's trying to take in what she's telling him. Really, Joseph, this is God did this. This baby that I have, God did it. How many of you know that's off of Joseph's map? Does God ever do anything off your map? If he's really going to do something supernatural, if he's, if he's going to take you and set you up for something that's never been done before, at least through your life, and it's going to be something from heaven, not of the earth, something... Something that's because of him and not because of you. Is it going to take you off your map? I guarantee it. But when he considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. (laughs) God's so good with dreams, isn't he? And this is what the angel said. Joseph, son of David. Now, he's not, his father's name is not David. What is the angel doing? The angel is grabbing hold of Joseph and pulling him prophetically into a promise that was given centuries earlier through the prophets that there would arise a Messiah who would be of the seed of David and would take the throne of David, which is what the angel told Mary. He will will have the throne of his father, David. And the angel is speaking to Joseph and saying, Joseph, son of David. Now that means something completely different to Joseph because Joseph knows his lineage. He knows that he is a direct descendant of David. And it may have even entered into Joseph's heart at some point. There is a Messiah coming. Who's going to be his dad? It could be that Joseph may have even prayed a prayer. Father, you know that I am of the line of David. Would there be any possibility that I could somehow be involved? Mary also was from the line of David. Could it be possible that she may have prayed a prayer like so many other Israelite women through the ages who knew the promise, knew the prophecies, and knew there had to be a mom and a dad? And maybe somewhere there was a spark in the heart and a little vision of a possibility, a hope. That, Lord, could you 
choose me and use me. We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But the angel very specifically speaks into Joseph's heart, Joseph, son of David. And that pulls something up. That pulls a file up <laughs> inside of Joseph of, oh, we're having that conversation. We're having a messianic conversation. Because, see, nobody walks up to Joseph and calls him son of David. He calls him Joseph, son of whoever is. And I can't remember what the scripture says his father was. It wasn't David. One of the ways that God works in our lives is he has already been preparing something in our histories that goes way back. You and I are never an accident that just showed up on the planet. The fact that you're sitting here right now and that you even believe and know him is because God has been orchestrating something in your life to bring you to this point. Our God is a God of destiny. He's a God who orchestrates all things, and he's, he's working things out. And uh, seeds get planted along the way that we don't even remember. Things, things that we, you know, they, they kind of pass through our minds and our hearts, and, 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 and maybe some things happen to you along the way that, that they were these moments of destiny, and you, you didn't even recognize them for what they were. But suddenly you're now at this point that God has appointed and, and arranged. And God knows how to say and do the right thing to suddenly pull you up into attention and say, Oh, is that what God's been doing? Is this the moment that I find myself in? The moment that angel says, Joseph, son of David, I believe that there was an eruption inside of Joseph before the angel even finished the sentence. Could it be? Could it be that God is going to do this in my life? Could it be that God has been orchestrating things in a way that I could have never seen them before? Could it be that there's something resting on my life that I never even thought was possible with me because I've just never seen myself the way God sees me? I haven't valued myself the way God values me. Most of the time, I believe that when God shows up in these moments of visitation, however he comes, whether it's by angel or by dream or, or other smaller types of things, but you're, you're being brought into a moment, and it's right now, and God's about ready to open the door. I, I believe they're, they, they're very significant, significant, powerful, and suddenly it's just like you realize, I'm being overshadowed by heaven right now. There's a greater thing going on than what my earthly mind has been pondering. And suddenly you're taken up into another level, a heavenly level. Every time you and I have the opportunity to be brought up into a heavenly level and ponder heavenly things, heavenly possibilities, something happens in your spirit. Suddenly you are more alive than you've ever been. Suddenly, you, you realize that you're caught in, in this incredible plan with an incredible God, and you matter. We were made for heavenly things, with heavenly purpose. We were born for such a time as this. How many of you know that God really does have an agenda for the earth? And his plan, the reason he put human beings created in his image on the planet is because he's going to execute his plan through us. And he uses whoever he likes. He, he can use pagan kings and presidents to accomplish his will. We are his creation. 
He gave an original assignment to Adam and Eve to take dominion, to be fruitful and multiply. There was an assignment to release the workings of heaven, the will of God himself in the fullness of him and his character, his love, all the goodness that there is in God and see it extended over the entire planet. This is God's planet. One of the things that the, that the four living creatures, as they're around the throne of God, the apostle John heard this. It's written in the book of Revelation. As they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord all, Almighty, you know, who was and is and is to come. Lord, you created the earth, and it is yours. And you have a plan, and you're executing it. It's all going to be wrapped up in you. But here's an exciting thing to consider is who are you and I in this plan, this grand scheme that God has? And this glory that is being released on the earth, would he take you and I and pull us into this glorious experience of seeing him released on the planet? And Jesus, the second Adam who came, and finally did what the first Adam could not do in living in perfect obedience and love with the Father. Restarts the clock for us. One of the reasons that the incarnation, as the theologians call it, the coming of Jesus in human flesh is so enthralling and so important is it God, by sending his own son in human flesh, by putting his seed into the womb of a woman with a human egg, and this God-man was, was conceived. It was about restarting the clock for us so that we could enter into holy, heavenly purposes carrying the very fire and glory of God and, of, and finishing the original mandate. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the prophet said the, the knowledge of the glory of God will fill the earth. That has not yet happened, but it's going to happen through people who are connected with heavenly purpose. It doesn't happen accidentally. It happens with people whose hearts are, have somehow been captured by heavenly things. One of the things that the Spirit of God is doing in the church right now is he's waking us up to realize that heaven is not about the sweet by and by. Someday I get the pie and the sweet by and by. It's not about later, it's about now. Jesus came bringing a kingdom now, and he said the kingdom of heaven is at hand now. Repent and believe. Step into it. And then he taught us to pray, your kingdom come when? Now. Your will be done on the earth when? Now. As it is in heaven, now. Heavenly invasion into earth. And God's plan has always been to use his people created in his image who have his spirit. The very breath of God flowing through us. And we look like him and we act like him and we talk like him. We, are, we have his DNA. And we're, we are multiplying like rabbits over the planet. And that our hearts have been captured with heavenly purpose. I want to t say to you as strongly as I can. Until your heart has been captured with the very idea that your life is about heaven on earth. Until your, the plans and dreams of your heart have somehow become wrapped around the plans and dreams of God and what he wants to do right now in the planet, and you see yourself as a vital part of that. Until that happens, you are not alive. 
You will live as an earthling. You will live for what the world has to offer you in the way of purpose and happiness, which is satisfying the lusts of your flesh as successfully and as often as possible. To gain as much power and glory and comfort and whatever else at somebody else's expense. To get to the top of the pile. That is called hell. Because when you live that out, you might be at the top, but you're a sorry person. But Jesus said, whoever would be greatest among you, they go down because they have seen something that is far greater than being on top at somebody else's expense. Their hearts have been captured with the love of God, and they have decided, I'm going to spend my life for what God's going to do in somebody else's life the way he's been touching me. I'm living for him, and I'll do whatever he wants me to do. I'm just his bond slave. That's when you start living. That's when you really start coming alive. That's, that's when heaven starts pumping through your veins. That's when your mind starts entertaining things that are so supernatural, things that are above the knowledge that humans are able to attain to. The Spirit of God is moving through your heart and your mind, and you got something so glorious flowing through you, it just messes you up all the time. And you like it. And it causes you to, to just keep pondering and being in awe about, well, what's next? And, and who is this God that we're following? And, and how does he work? I want to know how he works. I want to know how I can partner with him. It's not a, this religious slugging it out, having a, I got to obey God so he can be happy with me. Jesus didn't look anything like that. When he was on the planet, he was the happiest person obeying God and loving God. I mean, people just looked at him and said, wow, if that's what it looks like to be a son of God, I'm in. I want what you have. Jesus came to give us what he had. He came to start the clock all over again. How does God come and Grab a hold of us, get us impregnated, if I can use that word, to conceive something inside of us that would then get birthed through us into the earth so the earth is changed. And by the way, there are no small births. There are no small things in God's economy. Just happened to have this little earthquake. Well, it was, it was a big earthquake over in Japan. But people are thinking, well, just one more earthquake. But now scientists are thinking that earthquake tilted the axis of the earth a little bit. And now they're asking, what is that going to do to the whole planet? What if we just had a few more earthquakes? You know, there's those, those little tremblers you know it it was only felt in just one little spot in the whole planet and yet it has the ability to tilt the entire axis of the earth god is looking for people who believe that he's so big that any even offering a cup of cold water in his name because you're being led by the Holy Spirit and the fire of his love is inside of you and you know who you are and what you have to give so that even that cup of cold water is a sip of heaven to somebody else and that even that small act can start a movement of God that can't be stopped by the enemy. Okay, something to think about. I want to finish this in Matthew chapter 1. So he says, Joseph, son of David. Now here's the deal. Don't be 
afraid to take Mary as your wife. Do you think Joseph was a little worried about that? I got a woman that I'm betrothed to, and everybody knows it. That's the whole betrothal ceremony happens there in Nazareth, and everybody knows Joseph and Mary are they're going to get married in a certain amount of time. Is Joseph just a little nervous about having a pregnant partner here? Is he, is he a little nervous about, I don't even know who the father is. And she keeps telling me it's God. And what is this going to mean for our future? If, if, if I go ahead and, and marry her anyway because I love her. We're going to live the rest of our lives in scandal. And my, this child that's coming forth is going to be considered a bastard child. Is this what I want to do? No matter how much I love her and value her, is this where I want to go? Do I want to be married to a religious nut? Who's having visions of angels and thinking that she, she got pregnant by God when I know it was a man. This is a scary proposition. Joseph, son of David. Joseph, a man in line with God's heavenly purpose. Now, they're think, when they think of the, th- the throne of David, they're thinking, oh, the Messiah is going to come and sit back in Jerusalem and bump the Romans out, and they're going to restore the Davidic kingdom, and the Jews are going to be on the top of the pile again. Oh, but God's got a different... When he says the throne of David, he's talking about something that's already been established in heaven. Joseph doesn't fully realize what this angel is telling him. Joseph, son of David, you're full of fear right now in this whole situation, but I'm telling you, don't be afraid. Push that human fear aside. Push your natural thoughts. This whole thing that is shoving you off your map and you, you, you thought you were just going to be this really good Jewish husband and you were going to live righteously and you're going to have a great family and be blessed by God and have lots of kids and, and be the shining example in your community and now it's all messed up. Joseph, don't be afraid. Don't give in to those normal thoughts. Why? For the child who has been conceived... In her, it's no ordinary child. Yes, it's true, Joseph, what she told you. What's conceived in her is of Holy Spirit. Heaven has invaded her womb. Oh. Whoa. You know what? We don't know what to do with stuff like that. See, now, the angel is trying to communicate something that makes total sense in heaven. It's a very simple thing for God. It's the way he works. It's the way he does things. Heaven just says, now we're doing this. And and God tries to tell it to us, and we go, oh, oh. You know what? I don't think God really expects you to understand it or appreciate it. But nonetheless, he comes and he says, this is what I'm doing. Don't be afraid. Step into it. Go off your map with me. Give up all of your yeah buts. But what about? (laughs) And how is this going to come out? And what is it? No, no, no. It doesn't matter. This is of the Holy Spirit. End of conversation. See, God is looking for people who, when they hear, this is of the Holy Spirit, this is of God, we just say, okay, everything's good. 
Everything's going to be upgraded now. Everything is going to another whole level that I've never experienced before. And I said that I wanted more of God, so here it is. I said I wanted God to use me, so here we go. There are, there are too many people, Christians, who say, I believe the Bible and I love God and, yeah, you know, Jesus. But when God shows up and says, well, this is what it looks like. And it's of the Holy Spirit. They say, not that way. No. Nah. Good God, this is uncomfortable. God, what? what? <laughs> Can I take back some of those prayers? You know, I, but you know, you got to understand that while God has compassion for our confusion and our fear, He ignores it. He doesn't hold your hand for a while and say, They're there now, it's going to be okay. Let me convince you. Let me, let me give you some glimpses of how it's all going to work out okay. He's looking for people who want to go off the map with him. They just, they don't care because they so trust him and, and they're so hungry for what Holy Spirit does when he overshadows and he impregnates. And I just want a piece of heaven. I want, I want it's not that I want to go to heaven. That, that'll happen. But I want to partner with God in bringing heaven into the earth. And I got to be a part of it. And that's what I'm living for. Even if it's messy. Joseph, don't be afraid. Mary, don't be afraid. <laughs> the angel is standing in front of Mary and saying, hey, you are highly favored of God. God is with you. And she's going, uh-oh. <laughs> what does this mean? <laughs> Whoa. And the angel has to say to her, you know, I used to think it was because he was telling her not to be afraid because she was so terrified by the presence of the angel. Well, I think she was a little nervous about that. But it says that she kept pondering over and over again in her heart. What does this mean? Where is this going? Why is this happening? And, you, and we've got to get in touch with the human reality. I'm, te- I'm just sharing this with you on purpose up front because many of you are getting positioned right now by God to step into things that have already been written in heaven about you. And the way that God has planned before he created the world and he saw you and put you on the planet in Montana at this time in history because there's something that he's getting ready to do to invade earth and your name is on it. But he's got to get you ready. He's, he's, he's got to have your heart so that you're not afraid. You're willing to go off your map. You're willing to have him blow all your plans. You're willing to have him even mess up your relationships and to look foolish, to accept assignments. God didn't tell Joseph, it's going to be okay. I'm going to reveal to everybody around you that I did this. No, it's going to remain a secret between God and Joseph and Mary and everybody else is going to think scandalous thoughts and their reputation in Nazareth is going to be awful and even Jesus himself will not be acceptable in their midst. He's a bastard son, no matter how good he grows up to be. Oh, gosh. Why would God do something like that? 
So your assignment, should you choose to accept it, <laughs> is to carry that. Why? So that the earth can be invaded with something that is never seen before in a way that the earth never expected it. To do something that has to be done so that heaven can invade earth, so that God can reset the clock for all of humanity. Now, we all know as we read this story, this is a big assignment, one of the biggest assignments in the Bible. But don't compare yourself to that. God has big assignments. He's got what may look like smaller assignments. But you know what? In heaven, it's all the same. There are no big assignments, small assignments. There is no bigger pay and lesser pay. It pays the same. God's just looking for people. So whether you're standing up on a platform in front of thousands preaching and seeing masses, you know, like Reinhard Bonnke in Africa, seeing millions coming to Jesus, and, and Reinhard Bonnke is a, a household name, in, you know, to millions of Christians around the planet, or whether it's just little old you tucked away somewhere taking care of orphans like Roland Baker's grandfather, grandmother in China having no idea that these little orphans that they take in that nobody wants just trying to save their lives are going to have heavenly encounter and a revival get birthed out of that little town and those little Chinese kids that was going to carry a fire that would roll all the way down to our present moment and, and, and capture the hearts of a Roland and Heidi Baker now in Mozambique who just went there to take care of a few orphans and, and, the, and this fire that's coming out of Mozambique is just running all over the planet. Through a couple, when you ask them, how is this happening? And they say, I don't know. Well, what are your plans? We don't have any. Well, what are your methods? They Obviously, you've got great strategies and methods. Um, we just pray and we love and we show up. God does the rest. Well, how do you get... 300 plus people raised from the dead. You must be training disciples on how to raise. No, they just do it. Because the Spirit of God is on them. Most of them can't even read or write. But they can raise the dead. So God is wanting to find people through whom he can confound the whole world. Mary and Joseph were the least likely on the planet from the world's perspective to be chosen for such an assignment. And probably in their own eyes. Except for this. They're highly favored in heaven. That's the first thing the angel says to Mary. What he's really saying to her, Mary, the reason I'm here talking to you instead of somebody else is because in heaven, God sees you in a particular way. His favor is all over you. In fact, it's, it's above average. You see, God, I, I think in heaven, God was looking for who can I do this through? Now, there's, there have been literally thousands of books written in history about Mary and this whole situation. Scholars, theologians, pastors have tried to capture what is this? We're so fascinated with the story of 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 a, a little Jewish girl getting chosen by God and then she gets to give birth to the Son of God 
that God would do such a thing. It captures our hearts. We, we love the story. But there's something underneath the story that's screaming into history right now, screaming into the church right now to say, I, God, who did this, am ready to do it again and again and again through people who are favored. I'm looking. See, my eyes are running to and fro throughout the whole earth in order that I might find somebody through whom I can show myself strong and do amazing things that will change the world. Release heaven on earth. Tilt the axis of the earth. Satan doesn't know what to do with a person who is that connected to heavenly favor. Because when God can find a person that he can move through... He can shake the planet. He can shake the kingdoms of darkness. He can release his kingdom in a whole new way. Things, structures that were standing up in the way of God, that were holding back the presence of God, the light of God in a place, suddenly are shaking and falling, and God begins to move. The unthinkable begins to happen. A lot of people have written that, that the reason why the angel said to Mary, you are highly favored, is because, well, God obviously chose her, so she's highly favored. You know, that whomever God would choose for this position is, well, what favor? And that the angel was, was you know, glad to be in the presence of, of this girl whom God had chosen, and, you know, and she's just more highly favored because God chose her. But I would like to say, yes, that's true, but there's another side to the coin. And that is that she was chosen because she had already found favor with God. We have in the Old Testament the story of God looking for a king for Israel because Saul had failed so miserably in the assignment that he was given. God is looking for another king. And he sends Samuel. He tells Samuel, Samuel, stop grieving over Saul. I've got, I've got a plan B now. And I want you to go to this town, and I want you to visit the family of Jesse. There you will find the one I've chosen because he's got a different heart than Saul. He's not like Saul. He's going to rule and reign over Israel with my heart this time. He's going to care about what I care about. And you know the story where Samuel comes in and he, he, Jesse brings all of his sons in front of Samuel. And Samuel is looking at each one of them. He starts with the oldest. And he says he looked at the oldest one and said he was big and handsome. Looked really, you know, he's the oldest son. And. And, uh, and, and Samuel says to himself, surely this is the Lord's anointed. And God says, nah. And Samuel, you know, you can almost feel like he's, what? I'm a prophet. How did I miss it? <laughs> you know? and God says, and God says to him, man looks on the outward appearance. I look at the, oh, 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 that changes everything. You know what's getting ready to happen is that the church is going to get its heart back. We're going to become a people of the heart of God. It's not going to be in the brain anymore. It's not going to be outward performance of religious things and all the rest. God says, I've had enough of that. I, I've had enough of people who praise me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. If there's, if there's something screaming out of heaven right now, it's all about the heart. God says to Samuel, nope, not that one. Nope, not that one. I mean, it's, it's crazy. He's just saying, reject, reject, reject. 
Not because he doesn't like them. It's just they can't handle the assignment. Not this assignment. And Samuel's totally confused now. He's saying, God said no to all the sons, and yet he sent me here to your house. Do you know what happened? Do you have another son? Well, yeah, but, you know, he's, he's the squirt. He's, you know, he's the youngest. He's, he's out there, bah. You know? He's, you know, the only thing he can do is take care of sheep right now. I mean, my oldest son, look at these oldest sons. Man, they are warriors. They have killed some Philistines. They have been valiant for God. And God's saying, nope. David walks into the room, and the Spirit of God comes on Samuel. He says, this one, rise up and anoint him now, for he has my heart. Shocked everybody. This isn't appropriate for God to choose the youngest son. It's supposed to be the oldest son. God chooses whom he chooses because he looks into the heart. What I want to say to you is that he looked and he found in Mary and in Joseph something above the grade. They weren't richer. They weren't smarter. They weren't more educated. They weren't more anything. They were really kind of down at the bottom of the, of the pile. If they were living in India, they'd be lower caste, most likely. Mary, you have found favor with God. You know, you want to know what was in Mary's heart? Look, look at Luke chapter 1. I'm going to wrap up here now. Throughout church history, this has been referred to as the Magnificat, in which Mary magnifies the Lord in, in such a way. But this is what's in Mary's heart. Now, this, I, I used to think, wow, wow, the Holy Spirit really came on her. She got some good words here. You know, and, uh, you know, this is all after the fact, after, you know, the Spirit has come and all the rest. But I felt like the Lord tapped me on the shoulder and said, actually, Paul, this was in her heart before the angel ever came. Look at these words. And Mary said, my soul exalts the Lord. What does that tell you about Mary right from the beginning? She's a worshiper. She doesn't have any problem. She's busting loose. She walks through the door of Elizabeth's house, and Elizabeth just uncorks, you know, and she's just, you know, all this prophetic stuff is coming. And, and then Mary responds, my soul exalts the Lord. And my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior, for he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. See, Mary, she, she's a young teenage girl, and she understands this. She understands this because she is, her mind has been wrapped around God's purposes. She has actually been thinking about what God wants to do in Israel, how God wants to move through a Messiah. She's, and she's saying, and here I am, I've been chosen, and now look what's going to happen. She has spiritual understanding about what's taking place. She's like the sons of Issachar who understood the times and know what to do. The Spirit of God has been resting on this young girl for quite a while, and she's been saying, yes, I love it. I love God. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Would you like to run into a teenager that talks like that? Some of you have, have one. <laughs> Hallelujah. Holy is his name. And his mercy is upon generation after generation towards those who fear him. She's now quoting scripture. She knows the word. Why? Because she loves the word. She's been taught. She's been instructed. 
She loves the word of God. Now she's just spitting it out in her praise. Wow. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from the thrones and he has exalted those who were humble, which is me. <laughs> Look what he's done for me. See, what she's saying is everything that I have known about God and the way that he works, it happened to me. I was humble, and now look at me. See, she understands the way God works. She understands who God is looking for. She's connected to it. This tells me something about Mary and why God would have chosen her. She loves what God is doing. She's looking for God's purposes in the planet. She's been positioning herself to be the handmaiden of the Lord. Whew. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy. She even knows the history of Israel and what's been going on and what God wants to do. And as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. Now that is called a mouthful. That came out of this little young woman's heart. No wonder Gabriel shows up and says, you who are highly favored. I want to say to you, if you want to be a person through whom God can birth some purposes and plans in the earth to bring heaven into earth during your lifetime. Become in your heart a person whom God looks at and says, I see me. I see my heart. I see my desire. I see somebody that is after me and what I want to do in the planet. They want that more than they want their own dreams, more than they want their own self, more than they want the American dream. And you have to be a person who is willing to let God take you off your map and push past your fears and your agendas and what you were hoping for, and the way you thought it was supposed to happen, and you just say, Holy Spirit, come. Be it done unto me, as you are saying. And I don't understand it, and I can't control it, but it's the fire of God. Come now and use me. And no matter what it costs me, no matter how much I may struggle with this. And how many of you know the rest of the story gives us a foretaste of the struggle that Mary and Joseph were yet to embrace? Just the whole thing in Bethlehem, that was just the beginning of the struggles that they would go through. Running for their lives down to Egypt, having to leave everything family, support structure, all they, they own, they're running. To Egypt and God's got to take care of us down there can God do that can God take care of us in Egypt and then I have to go back and live in Nazareth the place of scandal and on and on and on you know it's nice when the magi show up with gifts that's when you know you're on track and God supplies. And, and, you know, but that was two years later. Two years of going through hell to have this kid. And then they show up and suddenly it's like, oh, God. Aren't we glad we've been obeying God? But then the Magi leave. And suddenly you're running <laughs> to the next thing and you're questioning, oh, God. Is this the way it was supposed to be? And he doesn't say a thing except 
follow me. And Mary carried this all the way to the cross and stood and watched her own son being crucified. And she had to go through the crucifixion to get to the resurrection as only a mother. She stood there like no other through the entire life of Jesus, watching him fulfill his plan and purpose, not understanding all that was going on. And she had to live through that whole thing all the way to the morning that she saw him raised from the dead. And now, now she knows. See, there, there will come a point farther down the road where we understand this was really worth it all. But Mary and Joseph could have given up anywhere along the way. If you will set your heart to be this kind of person, the Spirit of God will come and overshadow you and will impregnate you with something that only heaven can give you, to bring something through you that only heaven can do. There are very few people on the planet who know what that's like. It shouldn't be that way. Every one of us was born for this. I believe, as I was driving here this morning, I was pondering this, and I believe that the number one assignment that I have as a leader in this church is to awaken you to heavenly possibility. It's my number one assignment. To open up what heaven can do for you, to you, through you. It's what drives me more than anything else. I just happen to be happy that I'm in the midst of the people that are saying, I'll take some of that. But I believe there's a fire coming that's going to hit our church in this next year. And that's why this uh, week of prayer and fasting is going to be so important. In January, there's a fire coming that's going to land and consume chaff and d come down way deeper and capture our hearts if we'll let it. And God's going to give us more. So more of heaven can be released in individually in our lives and into this valley, into this state, and into the nations of the world. We haven't seen anything yet. So the ball's in our court. What do we want? What will we let God do? I want to challenge you in this Christmas season, this is a good time to just sit and take time to worship, 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 worship. Be in the story. Ponder the promises of God. Let God capture your heart again. Let the Spirit of God come and overshadow you in this season. It's a very important season. Let him overshadow you. Let him put something in you. But count the cost. Be, be, be sure to hear the Lord say to you, now don't be afraid. And then make the choice to not be afraid. Make the choice to go off your map with God. And says, hey, you know what? I'm going to live the adventure of a lifetime. I'm going to change the world. Wow. Let's stand. Can we just put our hands over our heart? And, uh, Lord, we just, this is a season of the heart. Not just the Christmas season, but this whole next season of the Spirit of God brooding 
over us, hovering over us, hovering over our nation, over the church in America. And Lord, you're, you've just been making it so clear to me. You're going after the heart like never before. And you're a master at it. You won't relent until you have it all. Until you hear us say, my heart is yours. And we say, Lord, I place you as a seal upon my heart. Come be the fire inside of me. Come capture my heart. Lord, I want you to look upon me as you looked upon Mary and upon Joseph. I want to be one of those who finds favor in heaven, highly favored for some pretty amazing assignments. I was born for destiny. Give me a heart of destiny. Take me up above the paltry things of the world. Take me above the glitz and the tinsel and the, and the other stuff that's trying to steal my Christmas. My Christ mass, my Christ worship. Bring me fully in connection with you again. Lord, let angels start coming around and singing around me. Let me be born again into your purposes. In Jesus' name, let it be done unto me as you have spoken. Amen.